Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. What would happen to the world if God's children would love as he loved us? What would happen to the world? Just imagine that for a second. If we loved like God loved, how would the world change? Would it love back or would it get worse? Because Jesus did come and he did love and many did receive that love and learn to love back, but also many rejected that love and actually responded in hatred towards him. How would the world respond? Someone wrote this, love is a spark that kindles the fire of compassion. Compassion is the fire that flames the candle of service. Service is the candle that ignites the torch of hope. Hope is the torch that lights the beacon of faith. Faith is the beacon that reflects the power of God. And God is the power that creates the miracle of love. What a beautiful saying there. It all stems from the heart of God, love. He has taken all of the commandments in the Old Testament and he surmised them all into two basic commandments. And we know this, we find it in Mark chapter 12, verse 38, where the Pharisees had come to him and they had basically asked him through some lawyers a question pertaining to the commandments. And they asked, which is the greatest commandment in the laws? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law. He summarized them all into two laws. Love God and love your neighbor. Pretty simple. A four-year-old girl hanging onto a doll with her pudgy little arms, squeezing that doll, looked up at her mother and says, Mom, I love them and I love them and I love them, but they never love me back. How true of some Christians who are loved and loved and loved by God, yet they never love him back. We are an imperfect people loved by a perfect God. And that is what's so amazing about God, that we are imperfect. We don't know how to fully love, and yet God loves us. That is amazing. As I was studying for today's message, uh, my wife and I uh, were sharing some coffee at uh, this little cafe out over there, Starbucks, and... <laughs> And we were talking about God's love. I just wanted to get her opinion and and just listening to her and then as I would remark and, and so forth, we were just both kind of blown away uh, as we realized how much God loves us, but how much God loves the world that doesn't love God. That is pretty amazing. And I think that as we get into this study, we will see that's exactly what Jesus is saying to do. In order to touch a world that hates God, we have to love our enemies. We have to love our enemies. And so this morning's theme is love your enemies. And that is a difficult thing to do, isn't it? To love your enemies. It is so much easier to hate them, to ignore them, to just forget about them, even cast them to God. But yet God says, love your enemies. So let's, uh, let's read this morning's text 43 through 48. Jesus again starts off this section in the chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemies or you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is teaching principles by which individuals should deal with other individuals here. 
we have been noticing in this chapter that he is talking about relationships. And so we've been focusing on marriage relationships, but also on our own relationships. And who knows, if we can grasp what Jesus is saying here about loving our enemies, loving one another, just loving, maybe we can even see souls win to Christ. Because it's love that draws men to repentance. It's the kindness of God, uh, Paul tells us in Romans. It is what drew me to repentance was the love of God. When God began to reveal himself to me through his love by performing miracles in my life, in Virginia's life, in our family, they were younger, they don't remember these things, but they were just things that we saw God's hand involved in. And as I began to study about God and about his love and how much he loved me by looking at the cross, I realized, wow, that is an amazing love. Because I know how much my wife loved me. I know that she's put up with me. I know she loved me unconditionally. And if she loved me that much and God says he loves me even more, I was blown away by it. And it was that love that drew me to repentance to get on my knees and ask God for forgiveness for all of my sins. There was a story that was circulating. It's legend, whether it's true or not, we don't really know, but I thought it was an interesting story concerning the Apostle Paul. Talks about a wealthy merchant traveling through the Mediterranean world looking for a distinguished Pharisee, Paul. But he encountered Timothy, who arranged a visit with Paul. And at the time, Paul was in prison in Rome. Stepping inside the cell, the merchant was surprised to find a rather old man, physically frailed, but whose serenity and magnetism challenged him deeply. They talked for hours. Finally, the merchant left with Paul's blessing. And outside the prison, the concerned man inquired, what's the secret of this man's power? He asked Timothy. I've never seen anyone with such power, with such authority. And Timmy says, you can't guess? He said, no, Paul is in love. And the man thought for a second, in love? What do you mean he's in love? Paul's in love. He's in love with Jesus Christ. The merchant looked even more bewildered, and he said, that's all? And Timothy, smiling, replied back, that's everything. That's everything. Wow. If you're in love with Jesus Christ, everything else just fits into place. If things aren't fitting into place, maybe look back at whether you're in love with Jesus Christ or not. Let's take a look at the text. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's quoting again from the Old Testament. Let's start back there, he says. And you've heard what it was said. Now, he adds a phrase here, but he is quoting from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where uh, God is instructing Uh, the children of Israel, especially the judges, the priesthoods and so forth. And he's saying, you shall not take vengeance because vengeance is the Lord's, nor bear any grudges. Uh, So get rid of those grudges, those feelings, uh, have forgiveness against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself, God said. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. You shall love your neighbor. And yet Jesus said, hate your enemy. The Old Testament taught that you should love your neighbor, but nowhere does it say hate your enemy. It doesn't say it anywhere. Jesus literally adds this phrase in there. Now, Jesus can do that. He has all authority. He wrote the word of God, right? So he can do whatever he wants. But you won't find that phrase anywhere. I I believe because that's the natural tendency of man. And he saw that in man. That God said, you're to love your neighbor. And you've heard it said, hate your enemies. But what he's saying is, is that the natural tendency in man is to hate someone that that is considered an enemy against them. And so he's getting to their hearts that, yeah, you love your neighbors and that's a good thing. uh, But you also hate your enemies, your enemies. Now, there are passages that kind of influence uh, this type of attitude of hatred towards enemy, or at least a dislike, and, and you could maybe even draw from this and, and maybe even take it to a further conclusion, which I don't think God is, is trying, to, trying to get us to do. But we see it in Deuteronomy 7, 2, 
When the Lord God delivers them over to you, that is the enemy, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them nor show mercy to them. And so uh, what God was trying to do was cleanse the nation and, and he's sharing with them is that you need to remove them completely otherwise they would blemish you once again. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he's, he's basically saying remove them so that you become holy and pure before me. Don't let them stand. Now he's not saying hate them though. He's not saying hate them though. He's talking about protection here and not necessarily having an attitude of hatred. But you can see that you could possibly begin to hate someone that God is saying, get them all out of there. Kick them out. Have no mercy on them. Psalms 139 says, do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. And so the psalmist uh, took this idea that, look, those that hate you, I have to hate them. I loathe them because they loathe you. In fact, I hate them with a perfect hatred. Now, what does that mean? I, I, I don't know at this moment here whether he's saying that it is a righteous hatred or it is a hatred that is full you know, to the extreme. But again, you can see that you can get an attitude of that, of hating those that hate God, hating those that loathe God. And that's not what I think Jesus is talking about here. The en an enemy is someone who is hostile towards you, right? Someone becomes hostile towards you, they become your enemy. Or someone that you think, you think is behaving like an enemy. Oftentimes we have enemies that have never done a thing to us, but we think they're our enemies because of their attitude, because they don't talk to us, because they walk by. I, I can remember um, being at the other church, and I would get so busy during the services that there were times where I'm just walking here and there, and, and people are walking in, walking past me, and, and probably saying, hi, Reuben, and all of a sudden I'm just walking by without saying a word because I'm so focused. And, and, and then afterwards hearing that they're upset at me because I never say hi to them. And, and, and so... I can understand that sometimes we can have enemies that really are not our enemies. So Jesus is basically saying, love your friends, but hate your enemies here. That's what they were saying of old. Now keep in mind, keep in mind because you will find scriptures that talk about hating, that God hates, uh, that you're to hate. But we need to understand the Greek word there. The Greek word is used in the sense of loving less, loving less. Loving less an individual. I love my children more than I may love you. I love you less than my children because they're my children, right? doesn't mean I love you less. I, I don't love you. It just means I love you less because I'll put them first. I'll put my family first. I'll put my wife first and so forth. We are to love less those people in our lives than God. And we see that in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father or mother. Now, that's a strong word, hate. But if we replace it with the proper word, it's love less his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life. Also, he cannot be my disciple. And, and so it's not talking about hate there. It's talking about loving less. And so we are to love our Fathers, mothers, wives, children, brothers, sisters, even our own life, less than God. Oh, there's a whole message right there that we could just talk about. You know, do you lift your father and mother up more than God? Do you lift your wife up or spouse up more than God? Do you lift up your family more than God? Are they more important to God? You know, uh, do you lift your very life up more than God? You should love your life less. And so remember that. Now, who's our enemy? Jesus uses the word neighbor there. And the word neighbor there has a broader sense. Literally, it means one near. Uh, we get the English word nay or neighbor, a near person, indicating an outward nearness or proximity. And so Jesus basically is saying anybody that's near you. So a neighbor might be an enemy, any one that is around you now is this a good philosophy for us to have as christians i think we'd all say no no we want to be like christ and we want to love and so jesus says in verse 44 but i say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you 
Now the word persecution there is specifically directed to Jesus' followers. And so Jesus is speaking to them. Look, I say to you, this is the correct way to love. Love your enemies, not just your neighbors, but your enemies also. Bless them, do good to them, pray for them, especially if they spitefully persecute you, and they will in the future. Love is not simply words. Love is a commandment with application, and that is what we oftentimes miss. We think that if we say, I love you, that that is enough. And if we say it several times, then boy, we really love you. But there's more to that love than just words. It has to have deeds and action behind it. Where are the deeds and where are the actions? Now, there were other philosophies at that time that had the same philosophy of love. The ancient Babylons had a text that talked about, do not return evil to a man who disputes with you, but be kind to the evildoer. Smile on your adversaries, they say. And and the purpose for them having this law was because they didn't want to have legal disputes with their neighbors. And they said, try to work things out a little bit more uh, than usual when you're disputing with one another. The Egyptians also had a book of wisdom. And they said, so steer that we may be able to bring the wicked man across. Fill his belly with bread of thine, of yours, so that he may be seated and not be ashamed. And so again, there were philosophies of loving out there. I believe that they all took it from the scriptures where God told the Israelites that they are to love their neighbors. But Jesus takes it further, doesn't he? And he says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Christians will have many enemies and they'll have opportunity, many opportunities to love them. We have the world that's against us, just the world itself, the world system that's run by Lucifer. We have this system that hates Christianity, the moral values, the truth of it all, and it is against us. And the Bible's clear that if this world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you, Jesus said. And so this world will hate you. In fact, that's a measuring uh, tool for us to know that we are believers when the world does not embrace us. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. And so if you're loved by the world, you know, if if you like to party and the party world is partying with you, then you're just of the world. You're really not separated of the world. If you like to rob and steal, then you really, you're you're just hanging around your buddies are in the world. But if you stand up to that stuff and say, no, I won't do that. No, I'm not a part of that. No, then the world will hate you. And so Jesus is clear. The world is our enemy. The world is your enemy enemy and it will destroy you the religious and satan himself is our enemy the religious religion is our enemy john eight forty four. you are of your father the devil remember the religious leaders came to jesus and they began to accuse him of things in fact they wanted to kill him murder him is a proper word and jesus said to them you're of your father the devil And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And it does not stand in truth. Because he he has no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So the religion and Satan, they go together. Because religion is not what Christ has come to do. He has come to have relationship with us. Not religion. Religion puts rules and regulations upon you that shouldn't be there. Burdens that you can't carry, neither can the person that's telling you to fulfill these things. No, God says religion becomes an enemy to you along with the author of it, and that's Satan. They will destroy you. They'll put you under a yoke, and you will be miserable. You will be miserable. Government. Government is against us too. Acts twenty two twenty five. You remember the story with Paul and I was preaching the gospel and how government came in and they bound him uh, with ropes and he said to the centurion that stood by him, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman? And so government at times will become the enemy of the church. We see that today, don't we? We have become the enemy. No longer are they supporting us. No longer do they realize that they need us to bring moral values to society, to clean up neighborhoods and so forth from thugs and drugs and all the other things that that happen. But now we become an enemy and they're trying to destroy us by taking away certain rights and freedoms that we should have. 
and the last enemy that that we may encounter and many of us may have is our own family which is always the saddest and hardest to understand our own family can become enemies from time to time Matthew 10:35 says for I have come to set a man against his father and that's sad now Jesus said I have come to set apart it's the work of God that he allows enemies to be allows families to become enemies he said, I set them. I set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy will be those of his own household. Now, this is truth. It's what the Bible says. And so you will have enemies in your home. Why? Because you have a faith and relationship with Christ. And it shines. And it's salt and light. And your family does not want it. And so they become your enemy because they think you're religious, because they think you're a Christian freak, because they think that you have too many moral values and that you have no freedom. And so they become your enemy also. And Christ said, I've set them apart from you because you're different. You're mine. And they will hate you because of how you live. And so they become your enemy. And now you correlate that with the other scripture that we mentioned. If you... If you need to hate them, your father, your mother, your brothers. Love them less than God because your salvation and your eternal state is worth more than even your spouse. I hope you see that. Eternal damnation is a long time. Eternal hell is a long time, isn't it? Uh, we, we might think, well, okay, but you know, it's, it's no big deal. You know, oh, wait a minute. It's not worth anybody's life at all to spend eternity. And I'm talking about eternity as far back as you can think of, and then you get there, and then you're still not there. Go back further, and then go back even further and further, and you're still not there, and you just forever, and it's sad. But if we can love, if we can love, I think that we can gain some of these enemies into the kingdom of God. I think we can draw them in by the strange love that we have one for another how do we do this how do we love our enemies well it's simply said in verse 44 bless them bless them don't curse them don't don't you know talk about them don't don't laugh at them don't pray to god and say god just break them just just, just destroy them they're my enemy no bless them bless them as he said pray for them in your praise lord please take hold of their hearts they don't know what they're doing. I was lost once there too. I totally understand it, Lord. You need to take their hearts and you need to crush their hearts and you need to bring them to a place where they know you personally, Lord. They need to know their sinfulness, Lord. They need to know that they've missed the mark. They've fallen short. They need to know that what they're doing and what they're involved in is wrong and that they have hatred in their own hearts. Yet they accuse others of having hatred, yet they have hatred in their own hearts, Lord. Help them, Lord God. Pray for them. Bless them. Do good to them. Once in a while, send them a card. Once in a while, bless them. Once in a while, tell them you love them. That's okay. Loving them is not agreeing with them. That's important for us to understand. Loving them is not agreeing with them. Because in this realm of love of God, his very character, we know that he is, there is no darkness in him. In darkness, he will judge. And that's love. That's truest love in its sense, that he will judge you. Uh, when you sin against him or reject him. And that is because he loves you and he loves those around you. Your early Latin writer Tertullian declared that the one thing that converted him to Christianity was not the arguments that they gave him because he could find counterpoints for every argument that they would present. But they demonstrated something that he didn't have and he knew he didn't have it and that's one thing was the thing that converted his soul was how they loved each other how they loved each other and that is what he wanted was that love love is a powerful tool the bible talks about heaps of coal that if you can love someone it's like pouring heaps of coal upon their heads don't try this 
You know, don't, don't go to your barbecue after having a barbecue and just dump the coal over an enemy because you'll burn them. It will hurt them. <laughs> you may scar them for life, right? But if you pour love on them, it hurts just as much to them because they're, they're kind of, why are you loving me? I, I don't like you. I hate you. I disagree with you, yet you still love me. You buy me a gift here and there. You say good things about me there and over there. You know, you, you bless me at times, and you're praying for me, you tell me, and this doesn't make any sense, and yet I hate you. And it's like heaps of coal upon their heads. We need to love. And when we love, verse 45, he said, So because you love, you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust so that you can be sons like your father in heaven. Dr. Burns Jenkins was a popular preacher and writer. When his son went to college, uh, Dr. Jenkins asked him not to join a certain fraternity. Please, son, don't join this fraternity. It only will hurt you. And of course, what would the son do? Join the fraternity, of course. And so for months he lived with the secret, the son. He would speak at uh, church youth groups. And finally one night he was so convicted by the sense of unworthiness. Returning to his room, he wrote his father in detail of his disobedience. I, 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 that just blows me away that God would minister to a heart like that. Two days later, he received this letter from his father. It's all right. I forgive you. I knew it two days after you did it. Love, Dad. <laughs> Only a true father understands that completely. That even after they have done something, you have forgiven them. Our love will be different from the people in this world. It will be radical. They won't understand it. That's how radical it will be. It will be a love like Christ. And our actions will show that we're children of our heavenly father. Look at the example of Jesus on the cross. That is radical. To die for a people that hate you like that. To allow them to crucify you. To beat you, to mock you, to ridicule you, to spit in your face. And how many times have men and women spit in the face of Jesus even today without him being here? Who needs him? Who wants him? What has he done for me? You know, such hatred. And yet he still died on the cross for them for us, and for you. What an example. If we were to love like the Father, love like the Son, then we would be a child of God. That's what Jesus is saying here. So to be God's children means to love, to love. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. Notice his son there, his, that's ownership, that's God's power authority that belongs to him and he makes that son to fall on the evil and the good the psalmist says in 145 9 the lord is good to all we always say that for it god is good all the time he is good all the time. that is true he is good all the time to those that are good and those to their evil those who are just and those who are unjust the love of God for all people he has created is shown in the way he gives good gifts undiscriminately to all of us. We were talking about this again, me and my wife, were like, wow. Think of the people that are out there doing horrific crimes. And we often say, well, if God was so righteous and so good, why doesn't he just destroy these murderers and these killers and these pedophilers and these rapers? Just phew. Why doesn't he just take care of it? He will. He will, and they will stand before him. But right now, his love is being poured on them. They will have no excuse when they stand before him. No excuse at all. He could do it, but he desires not to at this moment. So that when they stand before him, and when we see him, we will understand fully that it doesn't speak of their wickedness. It speaks of God's grace and God's great love that he can love that much. And if he can love them that much, how much more does he love you? You, who is not as evil. Here, the article for evil and good does not exist because he's not talking about classifications here. 
He's not saying that group and this group. The unbelievers and the believers. That's not what he's saying. He's saying personally, if you are evil or if you are good, the sun shines on you and it rains. doesn't matter. He's not setting us apart. He's saying that he is love and it just pours to everyone, whether you're good or whether you are evil because he's in total control. It is his very nature and everyone's blessed by the Father in heaven. So the point being emphasized is that God does not limit his blessings to those who serve him faithfully. Even those who oppose him, he gives many good things to them. Think about what's, how good it is for some people that have a lot of wealth. You know, think about how good it is for those that don't even love God and yet they're blessed and it's all from God because God is love. So we need to be like him and then you'll be his son in heaven. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same? Now he gives us a, a, an example here. And it's interesting that he says tax collectors and Matthew is a tax collector. So he totally relates to this as he's telling this story. Okay, so if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Because even tax collectors do the same. A tax collector was not loved by the Jews at that time. Oftentimes they, they got their office through bidding. You had to actually go bid the government for that job. And if you gave enough money, they'd give you the job. And then you had the role of a tax collector. And then you would go to certain places, areas that you bid for, and they were yours. You would collect the taxes. There was a certain amount that was owed to government. You would collect that, but you would also collect above it. And that's how you made your living. And there were tax collectors that were corrupt and wicked and they were charging way overboard and abusing their authority and power. And that is why that they were hated so much. In fact, uh, the more they charged, the more they were hated. And the more they were hated, the more they would charge. <laughs> and it's just a cycle because of the hatred. And here the idea is that a Christian should be doing more than others because tax collectors do that, which you say you're doing is loving, and yet they're hated. Oh, tax collectors gather together and love one another. Hey, this is how much I got. What'd you get? Oh, good for you. All right, we got to stick together. We're buds. You know, we're against them. They're against us. And, you know, and they love one another. And we do the same thing. Well, that's nothing in your love. That's nothing, Jesus is saying. You got to love more than that. You have to love tax collectors. I guess the question would be asked, what are you doing more than those who are not Christians? Now, I believe Christians do a lot. Most hospitals that are built today are built by Christians. You don't find a hospital that's uh, hospital care atheist units, you know? You don't find hospitals that are built by atheists because they don't care and love like we do where we build hospitals and there are many City of Hopes and many children hospitals that are built by churches to reach out to this world. Exactly what Jesus is saying, to love the world. So he goes on and says, if you greet your brother only, uh, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do the same thing? So he went from social identity there with greeting one another, loving one another, to now your brother, more of a personal relationship. Even if you love your own brother, your own family, your own People, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. That's a good thing. But so does everyone else. Even the tax collectors love their family. So what more is that? What more are you doing? How much more can you love? I mean, even dogs salute dogs. So what's the big deal is what Jesus is saying. Paul understood this, Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. And so walk like God, love like God. He has loved us. He died on the cross for us. And so we need to die for one another. Now, Paul takes that in chapter five and he relates it to marriage, right? He does relate to marriage. And so he talks to the man and says, you sacrifice yourself too. Don't say anything. Just love. Just show by example. Lead 
in love. Walk in love. Be sacrificed. And if they persecute you and rile against you, that's okay. Be, glory be to God. Accept it. Enjoy it. Love it. Know it. And, and just pour the love of God on them. And again, it's like heaps of coal upon their heads. <clears throat> Jesus says in the next verse, and I think this one kind of just seals the whole teaching this morning about loving uh, and, and how much we have missed the mark. And by the way, you might be feeling that way. Boy, I've got a lot, I've got a lot to do. I've got so much to grow in this area. A I'm with you, amen. He says, therefore, in light of all this, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay, you, you, you need to love like him and then you become a child like him. Well, if you're a child of God, then you need to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And boy, am I a sinner. I fell short of that. Because I get angry. Because I have lustful thoughts. Because I don't always make my yeses yes and my noes no. I don't always turn my cheek the other way. I don't always do those things, and so I'm not perfect. But yet Jesus says, be perfect. Boy, I'm a sinner. I missed the mark. I'm not righteous like I thought I was. I'm not as good of a person as I thought I would be. I have so much more to grow. And this is where Jesus wants us. It really is. He wants us depending upon him, knowing that we can't do it. And so we come to him and say, Lord, will you help our hearts? Will you change us? Will you give us love, Lord, like you have love, that we may work humbly in your kingdom? Let's look at that verse again. Therefore, you, you is emphatic. It's talking to you. It's personal. You, if Jesus were to say it to us, it would say, you shall be. That's a command right there. You shall be perfect the word perfect is in the future tense it's a verb it says you will be perfect you will be perfect because the more you love the more you are his child the more that you're his child the more he pours into you the more he pours into you the more you become perfect future tense he's working in you he's working in your life thank god he has provided the help that we need to the shed blood of Jesus Christ by forgiveness in him. This is God's ideal requirement for mankind, to love and to be perfect, which implies the full development, growth into maturity and goodness. Not a sinless perfection. There's no way that we could be sinless. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, the Bible says. No, it is a desire and a hunger to love like God. And we surmise that in those two commandments that we read earlier, right? To love God and to love your neighbor. And Jesus now says, love your enemy. Love is the bond of per perfection. Let me close. We are an imperfect people loved by a perfect God. We are loved or we are all, we all love our friends, but love our enemies, that's what we strive for. The followers of Jesus are not to take their examples from the culture. We're to, t we're to take our example from Christ. We can't say, well, the world hates us. Well, they don't like us, and so we don't like them. And we hate them. No, we take our example from Jesus because he loved us. And God, the God that they serve is a loving God and therefore they are to be a loving people. I don't know, you might be convinced that you're not perfect. And I think this is the very reason that God has you here this morning. Because you need the Lord and you need his unconditional love. There was a little boy in Sunday school. After Sunday school was over, he went to his dad and says, Dad, what is unconditional love? Our teacher was talking about unconditional love. And the father looked at the son and he thought for a moment. He said, well, you remember those two boys that lived across the street? And they had a dog. And you remember how they would mistreat that dog? They would tease it, throw sticks at it. And you remember how that dog, every time that dog would see those boys, he'd come up wagging his tail, coming up and kissing them and loving them. 
even though they hated him so much at times, he said, that's unconditional love. And the boy goes, wow. Wow, how much God loves us. And we see that with Jesus. They threw rocks at him. They spit on him. They mocked him and ridiculed him. And yet he loved them unconditionally. That's the love that God wants you to have. And the only way for you to have that is to have him in your heart. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sinned. We all fall in short. But we can't not stand here and cast the first stone because we've fallen short. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That is spiritual death and physical death. You will spend eternity without Christ. But God has given us a gift through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if we believe in him, if we believe that God resurrected him from the dead, if we believe in our hearts, then God says he'll save us. But you have to believe that. You have to cling to it. You have to trust in it. You have to give your very life to him.